वॉट इज अर्थशास्त्र हु रोट अर्थशास्त्र और चाणक्य कौटिलिया विष्णु गुप्ता द सेम पर्सन वाई इज अर्थशास्त्र रेलिवेंट टूडे इज इंडिया फॉरन पॉलिसी रियली इन्फ्लुएंस बाई द टीचिंग ऑफ चाणक्य इन दिस कॉन्वर्सेशन ऑन इंडियाज ग्रैंड स्ट्रैटेजी आई विल रिव्यू द एंशियंट इंडियन क्लासिक अर्थशास्त्र शेयर विद यू वॉट आर द की एलिमेंट्स about arthashastra that impact foreign policy thinking and i also try to uh, explain to you whether it is still relevant or not in many ways i translate the word arthashastra to mean essentially state craft and we will look at those aspects of state craft which influence grand strategy and foreign policy welcome to conversations i am your host Muhtadar Khan today we will answer the question does kautilya's arthashastra really shape india's foreign policy and determine its grand strategy before i dive into arthashastra there are two things number 1 please subscribe to the channel like the video make sure that you click uh, the bell icon so that you receive notifications don't forget to subscribe to the channel and number 2 i want to thank those who support this particular initiative on india's grand strategy i want to thank us india policy institute uh, a think tank based in washington dc and i also want to thank dr sayed abdul khader foundation a philanthropic foundation based in the united states thank you to both of you for supporting conversations i'm extremely grateful arthashastra is the original how to book It is a manual of good governance, good living and successful war making. I agree with those who think it is the work of many scholars because the same text teaches you about morality and also about how to poison and kill your enemy using deception and at the same time it also talks about the higher purposes of life while also getting into the weeds about the nitty-gritty of diplomacy, espionage and war. it is a cocktail of idealism and realism i believe that it is quite possible that this book was revised many times over hundreds of years and there is essentially uh, a composite work of many scholars with many different experiences but the book itself is uh, is essentially placed about 2 to 300 years before christ bc Uh, so it is about 2200 2300 years old it's a marvelous book it's very interesting very fascinating especially the fact that it was written over 2000 years ago now while indian scholars and indian uh, experts on ancient history as well as uh, on state craft argue that this is a very unique book uh, i would like to submit to you that actually it is not nearly in every civilization and in different periods of time we have had scholars advising rulers on how to govern and in that process some of them have produced masterpieces that are still with us today for example uh, the most famous one in the world today is the prince written by niccolo machiavelli it essentially is a very realist document which means it talks about how to acquire and use power uh, and not so much as to how to govern but essentially how to maintain power and deal with your enemies especially enemies of the state uh so this is a, a, one of the key books of western civilization and then you have books uh, which are written in other civilizations for example in the muslim world you have ibn khaldun's muqaddima this also talks about state craft you also have the famous al ahkam al sultaniya by Uh, Abdul Hasan Al Mawardi this is very famous the theory of khilafa essentially comes from uh, Al Mawardi and then of course the contemporary a sort of contemporary uh, of uh, of Kautilya was Sun Tzu who wrote the art of warfare the art of war apparently is is underpinning the military strategies of many countries China and Israel included So there are lots of people who have written books uh, of state craft which are geared towards uh, advising the ruler on how to govern but what is unique about uh, Kautilya 
is that uh, Arthur Sastra was written about 2,300 years ago, and some of its principles and some of its teachings are really very relevant today. Before I go into discussion, I want to make two points about the importance of Arthur Sastra. The importance of Arthur Sastra has uh, increased exponentially in our time because more and more Indian scholars are trying to argue that Indian foreign policy has a long history and India's core values uh, as enshrined uh, in the Maurya dynasty era or even before that in the Vedas and in the Hindu traditions and Hindu mythologies like Rama and Mahabharata. So Indian values uh, and especially values of governance and foreign policy are coming from there and therefore uh, Kautilya becomes very important because now everyone wants to quote and write and as you can see from this search on Google Scholar that there are tons and tons of uh, new research and new scholarship that is being done on Arthasastra and on Kautilya's work. Uh, even modern day works such as uh, Sham Saran's uh, How India Sees the World, uh, it also talks about Kautilya uh, to the 21st century. Uh, Aparna Pandey's book uh, From Chanakya to Modi talks about the influence of Chanakya's thought uh, on Indian foreign policy. Uh, we have uh, Jai Shankar, the current foreign minister of India, whose book I have already reviewed as the first episode in this series on India's grand strategy. Uh, also talks about the importance of Kautilya. He also talks about the importance of Mahabharata. So in that sense, what has happened is there is a new discourse that has emerged in India, uh, which is trying to essentially explain and anchor India's nationalism, India's governance, and India's foreign policy in uh, Hindu ethics and Hindu values uh, going all the way back to the Vedas. So from that perspective, you could argue that while uh, there is no evidence to suggest uh, that India's contemporary foreign policy actually follows explicit principles uh, of Kautilya, and I'll explain to you later as to why that is the case, uh, but nevertheless, the discourse around uh, Arthasastra and Kautilya is producing, uh, to a great extent, the Hindu Rashtra uh, by arguing that um, Hindu values are influencing Indian governance and Indian foreign policy. The, the enclave where uh, the Ministry of External Affairs is housed in, in Delhi is uh, also refer referred to now as Chanakya Puri. So from that perspective, it is very important that we consider uh, what uh, Arthasastra is all about. Uh, but the book itself is, 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 is fantastic uh, as a scholar of international relations, political theory, and governance. Uh, I find uh, his ideas fascinating. It is not just a book about foreign policy or war. It is essentially uh, a how-to book about how to establish good governance, how to establish good life, uh, and so on and so forth. So to begin with, uh, there Kautilya identifies uh, that there are four human endeavors, and he divides these four human endeavors as moksha, which is a mystical goal of, I guess, uh, communing with God, uh, darshan, for example, and uh, my own book on Islam and good governance, uh, which I never miss an opportunity to plug in, is also somewhat in that realm where I talk about Ihsan as a principle that can help Muslim societies uh, establish patterns of good governance. Uh, and the pursuit is what Kautilya would call moksha. Uh, it is a, a mystical and spiritual goal. Uh, he feels that kings also should uh, aspire to that and to some extent uh, one of the Maurya emperors, uh, Ashoka, did aspire to that. And then the second human endeavor or goal that he identifies is dharma. Dharma is about ethics, it's about principles, it is about law and much of the rules that one would articulate about establishing a good society and a good government uh, would probably fall under the category of dharma. Whereas once we start talking about establishing a good soul and transcending oneself, you would probably talk about moksha. The other two human endeavors uh, that he talks about is one is kama, which is essentially pursuit of pleasure or a society based on hedonistic values, probably 
the contemporary era all over the world uh, where physical and other kinds of satisfactions are pursued. Uh, and of course, we have all heard about the Kama Sutra, which is about this particular human endeavor. So in that sense, uh, uh, Kautilya essentially gives uh, the pursuit of pleasure a very significant status. It is one of the four goals of human endeavors. And the fourth one is Artha. This is pursuit of wealth and power. And this is where he places the, the role of statecraft and government. So essentially, he sees the role of the state as pursuing wealth, power, uh, and conquest. Uh, and so this is how we must understand that the fundamental goal of Arthasastra is expansion. Uh, and that is why you can see the empire which was most influenced uh, by Kautilya's views uh, was the Maurya Empire and really expanded uh, extensively. Uh, uh, on its west, northwestern side, it reached all the way up to Central Asia and the Southeast Pass uh, part, uh, very much deep into uh, South India. So, in that sense, uh, one could argue that the fundamental purpose of Arthasastra is to establish a state which is expansionist, and therefore it falls into this fourth category of human endeavor, Artha, pursuit of wealth and power. Uh, and therefore we have Arthasastra. Kautilya's Arthasastra has now become a starting point for everybody who's writing a book about India's grand strategy or India's foreign policy. Uh, uh, this is where people start by talking about his values, which is quite fascinating because I'm not very sure that India at the moment seeks to become an expansionist state uh, uh, the way uh, Kautilya imagined. Of course, there are those uh, who hold the view, especially uh, among the Hindutva movement of Akhand Bharat and expansion and much bigger India, uh, which includes Myanmar as well as Iran uh, within the boundaries of the greater India. So yes, there are a few uh, people on the margins of Indian political society who do talk of an expansionist India. Uh, but nevertheless, I don't think that the contemporary establishment in Chanakya Puri or in any of the political parties thinks of India as an expansionist state. The most important foreign policy goal that really shapes Indian foreign policy today is autonomy from major powers. India seeks, seeks strategic autonomy. And India's goal is essentially uh, to pursue its national interest uh, without being overly influenced by other major powers in the world and in this day and age by Russia, China, or the United States. So that is India's foreign policy goal. Uh, but nevertheless, let us see what uh, Kautilya has to say. So this is Kautilya's vision of the world. So if you look at this circular concept, uh, the, the Vijigisu, Vijigisu, that's what he calls as the home state uh, or the conquering state is in the middle. And he believes, uh, like some political theorists, like Buono de Mesquito, for example, that contiguous states are most likely to go to war. And therefore, Cautilia argues that all states that border your, your country should be seen as your natural enemies. So every state that is contiguous to you is a potential enemy because the wars usually happen between contiguous states. It's very rarely that nations project power uh, over countries which are far, far away uh, using navy or other means. But the likelihood of, of your neighbor being your, your primary security threat is uh, the premise under which um, Arthasastra is written. And given India's relations with its neighbors, particularly Pakistan and, and China, uh, I think it is a pretty safe thing to assume. So all states that border with you, so the circle of states around your home state uh, are deemed as natural enemies, and because contiguous states are deemed as potential threats, all the states that do not border, border you but border your uh, neighbor can be seen as your ally because the enemy of your enemy can be seen as your friend. So essentially, he sees the international structure uh, as yourself at the center, and then you have a circle of friends around, uh, enemies around you, and then a circle of states which are potential friends, and then a circle 
uh, of enemies and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's a very interesting parsimonious model, not necessarily uh, valid empirically speaking, but given India's contemporary politics, you could argue that it is a pretty safe thing to assume. Uh, so if you have India, you have Pakistan as its in immediate order, uh, a potentially uh, threat, a country with which India has fought several wars. And then you have Afghanistan on the other side, which is a potential ally. And if you look towards the north, you have China, which is a potential threat. And above China, you have Russia, which is a potential ally and a friend. So in that sense, you could argue that even in contemporary geopolitics, uh, Cautilia's model uh, may be something that works. So based on this system, uh, he comes out with six strategies which have become very, very famous. And these are the six strategies that he he recommends. Uh, I will try not to pronounce the, the Sanskrit terms, but so these are the six strategies that he says should shape the national security and foreign policy of the Vijigisu, the state which is trying to pursue conquest. The ultimate goal apparently is conquest of the world. So he wants his state to be globally dominant power. So the first strategy he recommends is Sandhi, which is seeking peace, which means that for, for a country that is supposed to desire global conquest, he does say that uh, peace is better than war. And so one strategy that you can do is, is make peace with your potential enemies around you. So, the, so in that sense, he's saying that make sure that in your region, you have peace with your neighbors. So because your neighbors are potential enemies, you should try and make peace with them. Uh, the second strategy, obviously, is vigraha or make war. And in this, he has a whole chapter on how to prepare for war, what kind of military tactics to do, how to build forts, uh, and, and, and how to establish uh, an espionage system, and so on and so forth. So this is about making war, and he essentially is working out of uh, balance of power, even though he does not specifically articulate that concept. Basically, if your neighbor, who is a potential enemy, is weaker than you, then go ahead and march. Uh, uh, and anyway, now if there's a balance of power with your neighbors, uh, then he recommends neutrality, uh, that is do nothing, it's called asana. So, so, so in that sense that you have a powerful neighbor, seek peace, you have a weaker neighbor, go to war, uh, and then if you have a, a neighbor who is of the same level as you, uh, do nothing, maintain neutrality, and also prepare for war, that's called yana. So in moments of peace, uh, basically, you are constantly uh, preparing for war. Some people have translated Arthas Astor to say that it is the science of political economy. So and there is some truth to that because uh, Kautilya is constantly talking about economic development of the state in order for it to have greater, greater power. So he understands the fundamental connection in between hard power and, and uh, economic power. Uh, and so in, in this strategy of Yana, essentially when you're in maintain neutrality and not at war, you should be preparing for war. He also says that if you're surrounded potentially by more powerful states, one strategy for foreign policy is seeking protection, samshraya, samshraya. Uh, and uh, what is interesting is that his sixth recommendation is a combination of these two, which is a dual strategy where with some states you pursue peace and with some states you pursue war. So essentially don't wage war against everybody else. Try to balance the two, make peace as well uh, as have. So basically if you have two, two big neighbors, uh, make peace with one and make war with another. So these are the six strategies of Chanakya and people are I mean, these have become very popular. I think now every Indian who is taking his civil services exam <laughs> or doing a bachelor's in social sciences probably is deeply familiar with it. And I also suspect that in the training of Indian diplomats, uh, uh, Kautilya's Arthasastra is an essential requirement. Now, let me ask some fundamental questions about um, how relevant this really is. I think that that Arthasastra, while it's probably more useful for a country like America or a country like China, uh, who are to a great extent seeking and pursuing global domination, they may not seek that through conquest today, but definitely through projecting power far beyond their borders. 
For a country like India at the moment, while it may have aspirations of global domination at some point, at the moment I'm not very sure that some of the prescriptions of Earth disaster are relevant at all. In fact, uh, the, the ontology of the international system as, as uh, articulated by Kautilya is completely outdated. Uh, no notions of uh, established formal alliances like NATO, for example, uh, no recognition of the structural aspects of interdependence and globalization. So in that sense, we must uh, not really treat other disaster as a manual, like every time you go on an international diplomatic mission, you don't just refer to Cotillia as a foreign policy, uh, but to keep some of those principles in mind. And I think those principles uh, are, are, are easily summarizable, and that is that uh, that it is quite possible that all potential states in the system can be uh, threatening to you, so essentially promote self-reliance, uh, which is a very realist position, which is maximize your power in the system in order to maintain your security. Uh, but I would recommend that, uh, that scholars pursue this matter further and try to expand on his concept of uh, simultaneous pursuit of uh, not war, but uh, uh, military preeminence while also seeking peace. Uh, so, so in that sense, I think Arthasastra is very important. And one final observation, what the reason why I'm even doing this uh, video is because it is very clear that there is the emergence of uh, a strategic culture in India, that there are people now who are thinking about national security, about grand strategy, about long-term foreign policy. Uh, they un are understanding the, the importance of state capacity, state's values, and state's role in the international system. It has become very apparent to people that countries which have uh, enjoy an important status uh, in the world are safer and their interests are preserved uh, much more than states which are not. Uh, so India is developing a, a strategic culture uh, and the conversation about earth disaster over a cup of tea with a pan or some sweets uh, will only help move this conversation forward. Uh, and uh, so that is very important uh, and I recommend everybody, there are many, many versions of earth disaster out there. Uh, I recommend everybody who is interested in international relations, who are interested in foreign policy, uh, in strategy, in grand strategy, in military and defense strategies, should read Arthur Sastra um, as you read Niccolo Machiavelli's Prince or you read Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Uh, so this will also enrich you and uh, some fascinating uh, ideas and suggestions uh, which might just tickle your imagination. I want to thank all of you who have listened to the show. Uh, and uh, before you check out, make sure that you subscribe to Conversations. Do like the video, leave your comments uh, in the section below if you have interesting comments to make or suggestions for future video videos. I engage with all comments. I try to respond to as many as I can. So thank you very much for watching Conversations. This is Muqtadar Khan. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.